Hello. Hello. How are you doing? Hello. Peter Isaacs, welcome to Conversation Squared. Thank you. Thank you. How are you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. It's pretty early. It's what, 5.39 a.m. at the moment, but you know. Okay. Is the sun that. coming up? Uh, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I've, I've got my blinds down, but probably not for <laughs> winter. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah, yeah, but yeah, you know, I, I mean, this is the time I normally get up anyway, but um, usually I'm not straight into a meeting. But, you know, yeah. Sorry. No, <laughs> sorry for that. Sorry for that. It's nearly I'm 10 p.m. Sure. here. So, happy, you know. Happy to, make it, happy to make it so that uh, you don't have to be uh, at, at, you know, in the middle of the night or anything like that. Well, I'm assuming you're not in the middle of the night. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, thanks very much because it's, yeah, like it's it's very early for you and it's not really very late for me, but the kids just went to bed and uh, like li- the reason I asked if the sun's coming up is because it literally just went down here in the Czech Republic. Right, right. So it would be a nice little connection that we were just losing it as you were just getting it. But, you know, the yep. blinds are down. Let's not worry about that. That's yeah, just I a think- detail. I would I would imagine it's still pretty dark because it's uh, a yeah, winter months now, so or getting into winter months anyway. Yeah, yeah, sure. Which is um... technically winter started today. Oh, oh, I'm sad. I'm sad. We've just finally got your sunshine here. So um, yeah, but, we'll come right. back. yeah, sure, sure. And I guess winter won't be so cold. We're not talking like uh, mountains of snow or anything. No, no. It it does get it does get cold. But like it's more like icy winds coming from okay. uh, the South Pole, sort of thing. Wow! It's like big gusty icy wind, which isn't great. But no, no snows, snow except for in the mountains. But yeah, yeah. When when I heard that like years ago, someone told me they get snow in Australian mountains. I was like, well, of course, but still, it just doesn't fit with you know the stereotype in my head of like you know hot desert and you know like uh like really like lush coast but yeah in my in my mind I I'm sure the desert's still probably hot right now <laughs> yeah, i'm sure i'm sure so cool um peter please uh please tell me about yourself introduce yourself because i know that you've got some incredible news but maybe like as in your your new post uh yeah, yeah. but but please build me up to your new post. Tell me what you've been up to and then what you're doing now. Yeah, so for the last, I think, two and a half, almost three years, I've been working for Woolworths uh, as a conversation designer, the senior conversation designer there. And uh, for those that don't know, Woolworths is Australia's like largest retailer. So they've got um, a massive grocery business, a huge rewards business, uh, insurance, uh a, a company called big w which I, I think i would liken to maybe like best buy almost in in america I, I can't think of who it could be in in the uk or anything like that maybe uh like tk max on steroids kind of <laughs> <laughs> um, like one of those like sell everything shops and yeah. it, you know fairly uh cheap or not yeah. cheap counted um, no, yeah. I, I get you. I get you. I get you. It's like discounted um, bulk. So, yeah, I mean, no, it's it's probably not even like discounted bulk. It's just, it's like it's just low. It's good value, I guess. <laughs> would be, would be you go for. Um, yeah. And yeah, they've also got a telco business. So, like they're they're huge. I, I think they're what, one of Australia's biggest companies. And so I've been okay. working there. Yeah, two and a half, three years, and and I just started at um, Voiceflow as the senior conversation design advocate. So yeah, that's excellent. That's yeah, yeah, that's cool. That's um, and you're you're the first. You told me right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the first. Uh, you know, fully fledged conversation designer. I guess I guess you know, Braden is the CEO. Like he he, I guess has kind of become a conversation designer because he's so in it. But I'm I'm the first kind of one who's come from a, a you know an agency or a, a, a not an agent well I didn't come from an agency an agency or an enterprise kind of doing it as their day to day. Yeah that's amazing. Congratulations. Really thank you. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And voice flow like I've been aware of it for years. I think it started as storyline. Is that right? And then it became voice flow. It was story flow, I want to say. Okay. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Ah, it's great. It's a great tool. 
So yeah. uh, I definitely want to come back around to it and ask you a bit more about voice flow. But to start, as I always do, just to break the ice a bit and get, get us into a flow. Yep. Time, time for a 30 seconds go. Are you ready? Yep. I'm not going to time you. Promise. I never time anybody. But, you know, just... Uh, Some of seconds go. Sorry? Some amount of seconds go. Some amount that's somewhere around 30, but doesn't need to be precise. You know, just generally aim for that kind of ballpark and we'll be fine. <laughs> okay. Good. Excellent. So the first, the first and probably my favorite question to ask, uh, ask anybody, what's your favorite bot? Can be from any context at all. Um, this is actually pretty easy for me. Bender from Futurama. Yeah. We, we, one of our squads at uh, Woolworths was called the Bender Squad. So, yeah. Okay. Definitely. Yeah. And what, what is it that really appeals to you about Bender? I mean, just Bender. He's, he's funny and, you know, sardonic and, yeah. Yeah. He, he really doesn't, you know, he, he, he's kind of a total contrast of what most science fiction robots are, right? Because he's, yeah. he's really rude, terrible, useless, kind of just... Not, yeah. uh, not being this efficient, cold, focused being. Exactly, exactly. He bends yeah. things well, though. So, I mean, that's good. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. He bends things very well. Yeah. Okay, awesome. And that was, like, I think the most succinct answer I've ever had in 30 seconds go. So, well done. You get extra Thank points. You. Cheers. They can be redeemed in any uh, VUX shop. Nice. Uh, <laughs> so, number two, please. Um, what Aussie lingo should bots know? Um, so, probably the Aussie lingo that would trip a bot up the most is Australians have this collection of words which means yes and no. So, okay. yeah, nah means no, and yeah, nah, yeah means yes oh, yeah. and it's kind of this, like stream of consciousness like you're like yeah nah and then like, yeah nah, nah yeah like it's kind of you know doing that stream of consciousness and it's become part of the vernacular and yeah they're probably like that would trip up any bot i think that's amazing so i imagine for asr and nlu that's a real challenge right uh, yeah, no, nah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and are people typing it? Would you get that in a chat? No, no, no. It, no. It, it's more. It's more just like a, a way that people speak. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've never seen it in a transcript because I don't think people speak how they speak in general to a, a, a bot as they would to a human. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, that's definitely one which I would imagine would trip bots up. Yeah, cool. Okay, that's a great one. There's actually in Czech they say no yo, which is like no yes, but it's it's really like it doesn't, you know, it sounds like uh yeah no has a kind of conclusion, like you're building up to either yes or no. But when yeah. Czechs say no yo, it's just like I'm thinking no yo. And then they, you know, come to the conclusion. It, it, yeah, it's 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 a kind of it's a kind of similar sort of thing, like okay. thinking what you were going to say. The year is like I've I've understood what you're saying, and then the nah is a kind of the no. I don't think I I, I agree, and then then it could switch back to a yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. I love it. I love it. Excellent. And I can imagine, yeah, that can be a real challenge with bots. So it's great that, as you say, people uh, perhaps aren't saying this to the bot. I guess, yep. yeah. We adapt, don't you? Don't we? We get used to what we think the bot's going to be able to accept. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So number three, please. Um, and yeah, this is like you're the first person I've asked this question. I'm really intrigued. So please, yeah. Peter, could you pick three words to describe your career so far? Um. Uh. I've had a very random work, work life, so I think random is probably got to be one. Um, okay. I've been quite diverse. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 
The other one would probably be serendipitous. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, okay, so random makes sense. Like, uh, I guess you never quite know what's going to happen. Diverse, so you've you've worked in various different places and roles. Um, yeah. Serendipitous, is this like, in retrospect, you're like, how on earth did I get here and there? Or how, how would yeah, you interpret it, that? Yeah, so I, I mean, like to give people a kind of quick rundown, I've been, my the start of my professional, well, actually, I've worked in a skateboard shop from when I was like 13 to 18, became a sure. chef, then worked in an insurance company doing new business admin while I was trying to work out what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. uh, then wrote for a menswear blog and took on a persona of uh, a kind of person who was super rich and I would write about how to fly business class and all that sort of thing. Okay. I never myself. Um, then worked in social media at like a fairly early point. Mm -hmm. uh, then did ads. I filmed one ad with Paris Hilton, which was pretty funny. Okay. For a mobile game, which never came out. And then yeah. I've somehow fallen into like conversation for the site. So like it's all quite random and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, I think serendipitous in that I feel like I've been at the right place at the right time a few times and just mm -hmm. fallen into the job. Like I got into bots by us doing it at one of the agencies that I worked at and we just kind of built one for, you know, shits and giggles. And then um yeah, then then came back to Australia and I, I got offered a job to, you know, work on a bot for Telstra, which is, they're, they're like our biggest telco. And then from, yeah, I guess I haven't really looked back and I've kind of been doing that on and off for like six, seven years now. That's amazing. That's amazing. Like, good for you. You know, it's amazing, like, looking back, that seeing that, like, each was a sort of stepping stone. Um, yeah you know, that got you to here. And I, I wonder as well, like I actually, I'm quite similar, you know, in my in my twenties, I really thought I was going to be a rock star, <laughs> which yeah, meant yeah. that I had no money, which meant I had all sorts of different jobs, which at the time I felt like it was a real, for me, it felt like a struggle. But now yeah. looking back, it's like, actually I can draw on experiences. Like I can think of how people feel in various scenarios because I've been there and even yeah. Even you have different types of communication in these different scenarios and roles. Would you agree with that? Like, do you feel you're drawn yeah. on these experiences? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think um, I think that the thing which probably links them all is they all have like a certain level of creativity, except for maybe new business admin. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you know, it's all it's always been about creating something um, from nothing, and you know, I, th I think. Like if you work in creative industries, you know, you kind of get inspiration for ad campaigns or whatever from, from it's best to get them not from other ad campaigns, I guess. It's best yeah. to get them, you know, experience or, or, you know, interviews and stuff like that where you kind of go like, get that aha kind of moment. So, yeah. Yeah, cool, cool. Amazing, amazing, yeah. Really super interesting stuff. So I drew out your 30 seconds for, I don't know, like 10 minutes or something. So <laughs> let, let's jump on to the main part. Um, so this is roughly large language models in conversation and NLP design. Um, yep. You know, of course, we can jump around various related topics, but that was what we were, uh, you know, uh, talking about discussing yep. today. So, but... You know, I said I would like, love to come back to voice flow. <clears throat> um, yeah, yeah. How does it feel to be the first uh, conversation design advocate at voice flow? Yeah, um, it's pretty cool, really. Um, I, I think I've been using the tool for like probably about three years. Uh -huh. uh, and I've always had quite a close relationship with them, um, given lots of feedback. You know, at Woolies, we had a direct Slack channel with them. So, always asking them how to do things or breaking the tool in various ways and they'd just be like you find like the most random bugs um and that's been happening for for ages and i you know they've it's just been a really good relationship that 
you've had that I've had this kind of like direct link into them and to be able to show them what I'm working on and also like give feedback and that feedback's always been implemented super quickly and you know I think in a way like it, it's felt good to kind of have an impact on the tool so like when Braden tapped me on the shoulder and was like do you want to come work for us I was like hell yes yeah um and you know I think in my role the thing which I think it's the coolest part about this role is that, you know, conversation design has been around for like 20 plus years, mm -hmm. probably longer, I guess since the 90s really with, with IVRs and all that. And it's, but it's, I think because of these like big sh like technological changes, it's never really had like a best practice. So it's never had this kind of like, this is how we think things should be done. Like yeah. everyone's done something differently. So I'm really starting to think about, okay, like what's like the best workflow? Like how should a team be structured? What should a conversation designer even be good at? Like what, what skills should they have? So I'm starting to look at creating like skills matrix and stuff like that so that, you know, we can give that to the industry and, and it helps people find conversation designers or find people who could become good conversation designers. And then, and then doing lots of thinking about like, you know, for, for people who are using Voiceflow a lot, like where, when should you make something a domain? When should you make something a topic? When should you create a reusable component? How should you structure the assistant? Um, and also like who, who, who are the kind of um, main audiences for, for the, for like, for a piece of conversation design? So like what information needs to be in there for a developer? What information needs to be in there for a, a, a um, stakeholder and and all that sort of stuff so yeah it, it's it's cool i'm doing a lot of a lot of thinking at the moment and and also a lot of doing but like a lot of thinking about that kind of the whole thing holistically which is it's quite fun yeah excellent i mean it's really this is exactly as you say it's super important work because i think a lot of people are having these conversations and we are really trying to define this stuff but yeah. voice flow has been a constant for years, you know, like I think as far as I know, most conversation designers are using it. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, like something I really wanted. You'd be surprised. There's there's a lot of people still using flowcharts and Excel spreadsheets and, and yeah. that sort of thing. And you know, that's how I started as well. Like there wasn't a tool. Mm -hmm. uh, I definitely think there's a lot of value moving to a tool. Um, but yeah, I but, but even because people are still using flowcharts and Excel spreadsheets, the way that we do things as an industry is super fragmented. So yeah, how can we bring that all together and not get everyone to design the exact same way. Like, but but what are the best ways to design to communicate what you're trying to do? Mm -hmm. That's sort of, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which perfectly leads into my next question, which is. You know, something I would just love to get your perspective on is what's the best way for conversation designers to bring voice flow into their workflow? Yeah, I, I mean, before before I worked at for voice flow, we used it as the hub for all of our documentation. Mm -hmm. um, so we had, or Woolworths has entire assistance completely built out um, on voice flows so that um flows can be prototyped and you know tested and all that sort of thing we do all your user testing before you even start building and all that sort of thing so i, I think that's the kind of you know put everything in there I, I think there is a big especially if you've come from a flow charting world there's a big like lift to, to push that over but mm. it, it's totally worth it and in that process you learn how to design better you're like okay this is how i did it here like this is how i should do it um on on voice flow um and you know i think with the way the tool's going like we, we also have customers who who fully host everything off voice flow. so okay I think, you know in the ideal world i think that the you know one of the best things about the tool is you can have this really collaborative workflow between a developer and a voice uh, and a designer mm -hmm. and getting them to be equally as involved in the design um, and, and pushing stuff out and building it together. Like, I think, I think that's a massive strength of it. And, and yeah, like 
we're, we're starting to see that happen a bit and, and you know hopefully more and more not just like as the that documentation hub but also as a, a you know where where the assistant is is built okay excellent yeah this this kind of fits with my understanding of it that you know you can very quickly work out a lot of the issues that uh you know like test it and try things out before you actually get it fully built and then yep. any of those issues you can refine in voice flow uh should save you i i think you know the time you spend certain amount in voice flow is so much shorter than the time that would be spent when you're actually building it trying to deal with all these issues that will crop up so yeah yeah, that's great. Well, of course, I'm very excited to see how it's going to develop those things that you're hinting at, like the ways, other ways that people are using it. Um, so, uh, you know, right now it feels like as you're the conversation design advocate, this is an incredible time to be advocating the importance of conversation design, right? Because we're seeing yeah. these changes which are currently scrolling along the bottom of the screen, you know, like... Large language models aren't brand new, but suddenly it seems the whole world's gone mad for them. Um, yeah. One, one in particular. Um, so, like, are you seeing from this a lot more interest in conversation design? Um, yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Uh, I think, you know, it's definitely a really exciting time to be, to be in this. I think that um i i'm unsure if it, it's creating a heap more interest into conversation design although i'm you know i think anecdotally i'm noticing a lot more people uh engaging with my posts on linkedin and following me and stuff like that um in the last few months especially mm -hmm. since i started talking about large language models yeah, yeah. Um, but maybe, you know i'm just hacking the algorithm there um <laughs> but uh yeah look i, I think Previously, large like large language models, the interest around them was probably more um, centered with the um, conversational AI teams or innovation teams within enterprises. And now I think we're seeing like the C-suite start to yeah. go, how can we leverage generative AI to give our business a competitive advantage? Um, so I think that because that interest is happening at that level, it, it'll trickle down a lot more into conversation design and that sort of thing. And, and, and you know, those sorts of teams will be start to be created for sure. Yeah, I, I think you can definitely see that. It's like there's this rapid surge of interest and excitement, and then people are suddenly like, oh, actually, it's not just giving us a perfect result. As soon as we ask yeah. it one, you know, put in one prompt and get the perfect result, game over. Yeah. Yeah, it's like people are seeing how it can be done well or badly, and yep. we're in a great position to to give some insights into that, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, like, you know, currently, where do you see LLMs being used in conversation design? Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, if we're talking production, I think that, right now organizations are probably like a little bit reticent to go full llm um mm -hmm. and you know that's fair enough i think yeah. there are two fairly big things which people are concerned with um one being predictability um i haven't seen any ai solution that uses an llm not hallucinate yeah. uh, there's definitely ways to get it to hallucinate less but it's definitely a problem and you know i think businesses want a level of predictability i i don't think they're necessarily worried about the bot saying something incorrect because you know humans say the incorrect thing i think they're worried about the bot saying something like massively incorrect that ends yeah. up being a, a, a news story yeah. and, and then i think the other thing that um is holding people back is this worry about data and privacy, which is, you know, people, I guess, just aren't confident about what's happening to their data. Um, I think they're worried about it turning up in training, like what happened with Samsung. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. but, but it is worth noting that, like, that's an issue more with ChatGPT. It's not an issue with the APIs. So, you know, uh, OpenAI, Claude, et cetera, like they don't use your, your 
um, your API calls as training data um, by default. So I think you can let them if you want them to, but you know that's not done uh, on default. But yeah, where, where it is getting used, which I think is probably you know the more exciting things. I think there's a, there's a few things. So um, semantic search is, is one which is happening a lot. Mm -hmm. um, where I'm noticing that a little bit is, um, uh, well, sorry, where, not where I'm noticing, where I've seen it before is, is at Woolies, we, we uh, did a little proof of concept and I think it might even go into production. Uh, so one, one of the problems that they have is customers will come to them and be like, I didn't get my 60 points for a thing that I boosted. And to do that in the old NLU sort of way, you would need lots of entities. Those entities would have to like change constantly because those entities would have to be um, very personalized. So maybe you got 60 extra points for boosting Cucumber and then you bought the right amount of Cucumber and blah, blah, blah. So the way that we were doing it was we were taking a, a user's utterance, breaking it down into chunks, mm -hmm. then uh, getting the, the, the list of offers which could be available at any one time. I think there's about 50 that could be available, using those chunks and searching against those offers and then returning a whole heap of um, offer IDs to a carousel that would then populate potential offers that they could be talking about. And I think we were getting something like, in our tests, like 90% accuracy. Like 90% uh -huh. of the time we would return the right offer. It might not be the first one on the, the carousel, but 90% of the time it was coming back with the right one. Yep. Um, and then other use cases that I'm starting to see is like reclassifying fallbacks. So maybe someone, you know, types in war and peace. Um, and and you know basically you send that to the LLM to uh, summarize what they've said and then throw that summary back to the NLU. Uh, another big one is knowledge bases. I think that they're going to become a very big part of conversation design. Um, and then, you know, utterance entity uh, response variation uh, generation, like that, that's being used a lot. It's been using, used a lot in voice flow at the moment, people using that as a big part of their workflow. So, yeah. Yeah, cool. I actually, I saw you, you released an article, I think today or yesterday, where you were talking about uh, various things, but knowledge base was one of them and um, how you see the work of conversation designers being really focused on like taking this vast source of knowledge and basically uh, making it available to the LLM so it's available within the conversations, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, I think, you know, that alone, uh, because of course, knowledge bases are constantly updating. So, you know, it's a fascinating thing because, you know, it sort of puts the conversation designer in a position where they become the expert on the, like, whatever organization's knowledge base. Because we can kind of assume that the LLM becomes the expert, but because it has that data, but really someone needs to know what's going on there, like what they feed into it to sort of like smooth the edges and make sure that, you know, the right things are going in. Um, and so, you know, it could really push us into a new direction, right? Where, you know, the conversation designer is sort of managing uh, the, the organization's uh library so to speak like you know what what they have on their servers that really uh, defines business practices and you know any anything related to the organization do you think yeah, i'm on the right track yeah oh. yeah no I, I i definitely think you do you are i think so having a knowledge base the, the best thing about it is that so llms hallucinate because they're trying to predict the next token in a series of tokens. Mm -hmm. You ground the LLM in something external, then mm -hmm. it's got to predict the thing based on the external data. So that reduces the, the um, amount that it will hallucinate. doesn't mean that it won't, but it, it reduces that significantly. And I think 
what we'll start to see is some sort of level of reinforcement learning around a knowledge base uh, kind of dynamic. So you'll have people giving the thumbs up or thumbs down to, to an LLM on, on where it has pulled knowledge from, how it's structured that knowledge. Done, like There'll be this whole process around training the LLM to search for the right piece of knowledge in the right context. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I, I think that that's going to be a, a, a massive part of it. I, I at the moment, I don't know of um, like a, any any solutions yet, really, which, which are allowing you to train the LLM to hit the right part of knowledge. But I definitely think that that's like the, the, a big part of what's going to come. Yeah, I think. I, I honestly feel like with LLMs, I'm sort of, I'm following what a lot of people are saying and discovering with it. But for me, it feels like I love to interact with ChatGPT, but still, uh, I'm, I feel like I'm really on my first steps, you know, like it's, it's really like, I, mean, I, I think we all are. Like, yeah. I, I think unless you're some machine learning um, engineer, um, and you have a deep understanding of neural nets and, you know, deep learning and all that sort of stuff, like this all does seem a bit like magic. <laughs> yeah, totally, <laughs> totally like magic. Yeah, yeah. Like when I when I saw the first, um, that, that interview with Blake Lemoyne, who, who thought Lambda was sentient. Okay, is that a guy from I, Google? Yeah, the guy from Google. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, I, I remember commenting and being like, wow, like, the the way that it's conversing and the responses are so human like and it's so amazing and, and then i at, at the same time i was having like linguists like i had these like this like professor being like it's not real right i'm like i, I get it's not real but like yeah. you know like language has all these ideas and meanings behind it mm. so if you if you can predict language really well then I guess as a as a kind of side effect, you're going to pr project ideas and meaning and all that sort of thing. So and that was that was the thing that I was trying to get. I was like, it, it is like incredibly good at this. Yeah, it, it feels like a human. It, I know yeah. it's not, but it, it's like it feels like that. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think that's the thing that you know it feels like something that we can relate to, and it's so easy to slip into the illusion, so to speak, so easy to just kind of fall into it and be like, you know, like uh, to stop questioning it. Exactly, exactly. Which, which yeah. I guess you, is a is a problem. Um, yeah. Like, you know, humans anthropomorphize everything and, you know, m maybe we don't really want to be anthropomorphizing these um, things, but it's yeah. I, I think yeah like it's um exactly as they say you know even when we're talking with a voice assistant we imagine the persona that we're talking to even if it's not you know spelled out to us even if it's you know uh if it's not uh somehow like explicit but we imagine what we're talking to and i think it's the same experience with this it's like we we can imagine um that when ChatGPT starts talking about finance, we can imagine it's an expert on finance and you can follow that trail, like ask it various questions and then suddenly it says something, you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, suddenly the illusion's broken, but it, yeah, yeah. you can also have the opposite where you're like, oh, and another thing and oh, wow, you know, really believe that it knows yeah, what yeah. it's talking about. Yeah, I, I, I remember a while back I got... um. I was doing a little exercise where I was trying to get Claude to write me a blog post, to like just kind of see how good it could get. And then I was getting it to adopt different styles of different writers and it was doing that quite well. I was like, all right, I think this, you know, this piece needs quotes. Yeah. Like add some quotes in. So I added quotes. And then I was like, all right, can you give me references for all those quotes? Like, where did you get them? And it just completely had made up quotes, which did seem like they would come from those people. Yeah. And then those references looked like they were like it was like from, you know, Vox or, you know, tech 
whatever website and it all like made sense and it was just like all completely like fake there was yeah you know, had sam altman quotes and stuff like that and i was like oh yeah i could totally see sam altman saying that but like he never said said it <laughs> that's incredible it's like you know it can be the ultimate imposter you know yeah In a way that, yeah it's like it's a totally convincing uh liar in in those yeah. situations, not always, but yeah, 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 it's really incredible. Um, so I feel like I can imagine your feeling on this, but I would love to ask: uh, Would you say conversation design has been changed forever now that we have LLMs? Yes. <laughs> Next question. That's what. <laughs> that's what I thought. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I I really don't see how it how it isn't or how it doesn't get changed. Um, I think it's more of a matter of when, not if, um, businesses start adopting LLMs. I think, um, yeah, even finance will, will ad adopt them, um, which I think is that they've always been the laggards, I guess, because mm -hmm. they're, they're much more risk averse. But yeah, I, I think, I mean, in generative AI is going to change everyone's day to day. Like, so I, I don't understand. It wouldn't make sense that it doesn't affect ours um, for better or worse. I, I, I don't know, <laughs> you know, who knows. But yeah, like all white collar work is going to be, you know, changed. Like artists are going to, like, I mean, everyone thought artists would, be, that, you know, creativity, that's the thing that will never be automated. It's like it's definitely being automated. Looks yeah. like, it turns out that a lot more maths behind creativity than uh, we thought. No, totally, totally. It's just, I guess it gets to that point where it's such complex, unpredictable maths that that's perhaps, uh, yeah, you know, we had we needed this technology to really understand that, that it's these incredible patterns that are behind art. Um, and, but, you know, would you say we're overexcited? right now do you think we need to go down a gear or are we not pushing enough um look i think um the excitement for like the you know here are the 450 prompts that will change your life type stuff like that's potentially going a little too far um like i think my my linkedin feed is and my twitter feed to be fair are, are both um stacked <laughs> with that sort of stuff yeah um but in terms of excitement i you know what like i kind of think that the excitement's warranted like mm -hmm. we've been promised this sort of ai from alexa and siri and that sort of thing for what feels like since they began and now it's here and it's just like wow <laughs> like it, 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 it's it's um yeah it, it it's super 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 promising i think and, and it scales so much better like managing hundreds and hundreds of question and answer pairs and intents and maybe creating like a whole heap of logic around each intent about you know if your confidence is this then go this way or if it's got you know, your confidence is um, another way, um, like, you know, ask for explicit confirmation, you know, those sorts of things. Like one, once you're getting over a hundred plus intents, which enterprises get to, yeah. like it starts to become not manageable. And then you start getting conflicts between those intents. And then you've got to start making decisions about like, do I want this intent anymore? It's actually breaking this one. And, then starting to go, okay, well, do I need to like trim down the scope of this intent and how do I do that? And it just becomes really hard to, to manage. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I, I do think that, yeah, you know, the, the, the excitement is warranted, but the, the may, maybe um, the, yeah, there is definitely a side to it, which is just pure hype. It's like all the people who told me about NFTs and crypto are, are the same people who are now grifting the, the doing the chat GPT grift. So, you know. Yeah. No, it's always, got to be, I guess. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm at, it's nice that you just reminded me, like I'm actually very thankful that my feed isn't full of NFTs and crypto stuff because <laughs> I, I just never caught the bug, you know, it was never for me. So this is at yeah. least more relevant, even though it's yeah massive hype. But um, yeah, it's, you know, like what you were just talking about there, like what became unmanageable uh, conversational designs and structures and systems. It was like, you know, previously you had to really have the concept for what the conversations were going to be right at the start and then design that and build that. And you could, with some amount of confidence, kind of roughly know, you know, you had your use case and you built conversations around that and then things evolved and iterated and grew. But now it feels like it can be much more dynamic, right? You can sort of create the ballpark structures and know that, each user will be able to go their own unique way through that um, yeah. and in a way that doesn't fall apart, right? Yeah, I, I mean, like, you know, I think I think one thing, an, an example, I guess, would be, say you have a thousand products and someone asks, do, I, do you sell this product? For you to really be able to do that with some sort of degree of certainty to know that they're talking about that particular product, You'd have to have an entity yeah. for that product, and like if you have a thousand products, that's like a thousand entities, and then if you keep getting new products, that's like two thousand, three thousand, like that. That's a lot of entities. Yeah. So where where a large language model works quite well is like you could have your knowledge base of all your products, and then you ask the question. Potentially, you still use an intent for like, do you sell this product, and then it hits the knowledge base with the question it extracts the relevant information and then an llm you know summarizes it back Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's fantastic and i've got a question coming up in my mind which i didn't present to you before but i feel like uh i want to yeah i want to throw it to you and see what you think but you know with voice flow of course you know you've incorporated llms are you starting to see the best ways to document people's like prompts and designs within voice flow with like a kind of confidence about the like experience that's going to lead to do you know what i'm saying like because you know when we're talking about this kind of fuzziness with llms then that (laughs) immediately makes me think of documentation and how best to present that yeah look i think i think i I know Dennis, who, who's our head of machine learning, he's done a post about um, prompt engineering and structuring prompts and that sort of thing. So that that's super helpful. Yeah. Um, in terms of documentation, I, I don't think it's quite there yet. Um, we, we are working on some stuff which will um, help you better document where where you have been with your prompt, where you are, and that sort of stuff. Cool. So, Peter, uh, the angle's changed. Uh, we don't really need to tell people what's happened, but you've gone from one camera to another. It's, you've got your whole uh, production studio there in your in your workspace, yeah. and you my, know, it my, felt, my, felt over, like it was time for camera two. <laughs> overheating <laughs> batteries, exactly. Um, but something I'd really love to ask you about is you know, another thing that was in your article, and actually, um, please, the name of the article, because I guess people are going to want to know, uh, want to read that, that's from the Voice Flows um, Pathways uh, blog, like uh, yeah. like knowledge base, and the name of the article was, was it the future of conversational AI, I think? Yeah, one great thing in, well, many great things in there, but one I want to ask you about is um, that you're using... Uh, like uh, LLMs to help you write the prompt that will eventually yep. be used to prompt the LLM. Can you tell me yeah. more about that, please? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I sort of came up with doing something like this because I was finding writing prompts quite frustrating sometimes, especially very complex ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I threw my prompt at ChatGPT, I think, at the time and went, this is my prompt, this is what's happening, why? And then it 
told me and then I said, could you fix it? And then it fixed it. And then it, I went back and it had a different error that time. But, you know, I, I, I started to find that a good way to, to write your prompts, especially when you're writing chains of prompts, mm-hmm. was to come up with the use case, break down the, the, like each section of your chain of prompts, and then ask ChatGPT to kind of help you write it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, it, it felt, it, it feels like it's a, a much faster way to okay. get to the, the end goal and, and also have a better idea of what words or why something is going wrong. Um, yeah. you know, I, I think a, a, a good example is, you know, if you write the word should, that doesn't mean that um, the, like giving a word like should gives ambiguity to, mm-hmm. to what you're trying to do. So, um, you know, if you want something to happen, like consistently, like use the word must or have to, or, you know, those sorts of things. Uh, and it's, you know, that sort of helps you understand how to instruct the model better. Yeah, cool, cool. It, I mean, this this is super smart because it sounds like you're using the LLM as a sort of sounding board for your ideas to like basically collaborate with it to get to the end result. And it it should tell you what it wants in the end as you work with it, right? It should give you exactly. strong indications of what's working and what isn't. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's a cool, super tip. I hope that, uh, you know, like I hope people start working on that, uh, using it in their own workflows because I think it'll be really useful. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we have to talk about hallucinations a little bit more. You've mentioned them a few times, but are you finding ways to avoid them? Are you seeing, like you you said earlier that if you're using, um, I think when you said you're referring to outside information, you're finding there's less hallucinations. Could you elaborate on that, please? Yeah. So at the moment, there is no real way to avoid having a hallucination um which seems to be the term the industry has has le- uh, uh, landed on um, yeah. although it kind of uh, you know anthropomorphizes what it's it, it's just predicting the wrong sequence of words yeah but, uh, the grounding your llm into some sort of external data that it cannot um hallucinate mm-hmm. it is a is a really good way to do it. So that idea of having a knowledge base um, is a really good way. Another good way is to actually, funnily enough, use a kind of hybrid NLU um, LLM approach. So perhaps you still have intents, but instead of um, those intents hitting, uh, you know, your response, you have a prompt which has the information in that prompt to give to the customer. Mm-hmm. Um, that's likely to reduce the amount of, of hallucinations. So, yeah, it's really about, you know, giving the, the large language model the information that it needs to not hallucinate. Otherwise, it'll go, well, I think that this is the thing, this is the most likely sequence of words to come after what you've asked me. Yeah. Not, this is true. Yeah. And... Yeah, that's great. And what you were just referring to, it sounds like it's a really fascinating concept of, it sounds like using what's basically a now old school conversation design with, you know, the uh, NLU and intents and entities. Of course, that's still relevant. I'm just saying old school because now we feel like with yeah, LLMs, I mean, we're, in, yeah. Yeah, we're in a new phase, but like using that as the ground to to stop the LLM going off the rails. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So j- just kind of not a, like ha- having a, a whole heap of utterances that that guide it to the right direction always. Um, yeah, it is is definitely one way that you can do it. And I, I and to be fair, I think NLUs will still have a part to play for foreseeable future. Sounds like it's going to be a while, but like for definitely for the next few years, I I, I don't see them going away anytime soon. Yeah, sure. I think it's it's kind of a core, you know, it's a cornerstone of how most people are building. So if we took them out instantly, I think, you know, there would be a lot of head scratching of how to, 
you know, how to make robust systems, right? Um, yeah, so, predictable systems, which is ultimately what businesses want. Yeah, most. no, totally, totally. Um, so it's, you know, it's making me think when you suggest that, I know I was wanting to go towards the future questions later, but you've just teased me and I'm really intrigued. So if we did take out NLUs from the from the system, how, like, I can't imagine how that would work because for me, you know, currently that's my understanding of a conversational system that you have the NLU right at the center. That's the first, you know, that parses the input to uh, find out, you know, how to route the conversation. How would the system work without the NLU? So you would use your LLM um, and you would create embeddings within it that i mean this is when you're not hitting a, a a knowledge base or something like that so you you kind of still do create intents and then you mm -hmm. would have quite a lot less utterances so maybe like it's called like a, a few shot models so maybe you have like five or six utterances which represent a diverse way of saying the thing that you want to say mm -hmm. uh, and yeah so so you use those as as a kind of way of um uh yeah you you would create these intents you would have these embeddings within those intents and you would use those as, as a way of understanding what the the customer is saying mm -hmm. um when, when you were designing journeys what you would start to do is you would build out um journeys using more logic rather than intents necessarily. So mm -hmm. if you can think about it from like a voice flow perspective, potentially you're using, you're capturing the entire user reply and then you're using logic to go, did they say this, did they say this, or did they say something else? And then kind of using the logic to guide what happens next. Okay. Um, and, and yeah, I, I still think like there'll still be a use for triggering an NLU for things which, you know, you want to capture a very kind of specific thing, but rather than having this like sequenced approach of capturing that information, it can be far more dynamic. So mm -hmm. say you ask for, you know, someone's name, address, and, you know, credit card details or something, like you would be able to have this, a piece of logic that is going did I get all the details? No, ask for them. And, and then it'll kind of be up to the LLM to be able to capture them and they should be able to detect the, the date of birth. You know, maybe they wrote their, their birthday all in letters rather than the, you know, 21st of the second, you know, something like that. But the, the mm -hmm. LLM would be able to go, that's the date of birth without yeah. having an entity of that. Um, okay. Yeah, fantastic. It's um yeah, this is really, you know, it's it's very mind opening, exciting, uh enlightening. So um I think I, I know that probably uh I've not got you for so much longer. I've just got a few more questions. Is that cool? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Grand. Um so I guess this kind of feeds into, you know, I was wondering if there's anything that we're just on the verge of being able to use regarding LLMs and conversation design, and you've just hit on a major one, is there anything else you're seeing in that area that people will probably be using soon? Yeah, I think multimodal models seem mm -hmm. to be very close. And I think that's going to present something really interesting because like if if you so so i guess a, a good a good way that you can think about how this could be used so say um say your car breaks down and you call up the car fixing people <laughs> whatever they're called um, <laughs> roadside so assistance I, yeah I haven't, I haven't had many breakdowns um <laughs> well that's good um, yeah yeah a positive <laughs> um shots of volkswagen um <laughs> Um, so say you call them up 
and they say, oh, could you take a photo of this dial or the blah, blah, blah. Like yeah. if, you're, if you're training, you, you can now start training your, your model on imagery as well as a yeah. way of understanding. Yeah. And, and you could be like, you know, if the dial is this, this means that. Yeah. And all of a sudden you're, you're creating so much more understanding of the world that um, your, your um, model can interact with. Similarly, like, you know, maybe you get groceries and your eggs are broken and you just take a photo of your eggs and you send it to a, to a agent. You don't even have to give context. And they're like, oh, sorry that the eggs were broken in your last order because it knows you just had an order. Yeah. So you don't even need to say it. You just need to give a photo of the eggs. No. And I think that that's, that's probably the next big thing that we're all going to start using a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's great. It also makes me think of the potential to use gestures and things like to not say what you're, uh, uh, you know, not not say like, oh, this hubcap on the car, but just on the camera, point to it and say, yeah, the problem started around here and <laughs> my finger's not on the camera, but, um, you know, and if we have that ability for the system to take that as an input and with some amount of confidence know you know what's happening visually as well as verbally and all the different inputs yeah it's it becomes so much more convenient for the user i think you know instead yeah, yeah. of have, having to think how to describe everything verbally uh, that's going on to be sure that the system is going to be able to take those inputs yeah yeah I, yeah it's it's going to be um yeah, it's going to be pretty crazy, like starting to design conversations using imagery as well and all that sort of stuff. It, it's it's going to be pretty wild. Yeah, it is. it is. It is. It's just that's what we're doing right now. You know, like that's what we're used to doing. It's just we haven't yet had to conceptualize it and design it and, you know, like think, oh, you know, consider all the different ways that people are expressing themselves all the time. I'm so excited about that though. Like for yeah. me, that's that's really I, I can't wait, even though it's probably gonna be quite a massive headache and challenge, but <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, we'll start having to, you know, in the in the example that I gave, we'll start having to be training our models on image recognition and what that means and then, you know, feeding that back and yeah. Yeah. Maybe you'll have knowledge bases which are like including imagery as well, like that sort of stuff. So, yeah, yeah, yeah totally amazing stuff. Cool. Um, so you know, you're talking a little bit about where you see this going with multimodality and phasing out NLUs. Um, have you any inkling or feeling or even something you're excited about where this could go beyond that in maybe? five, 10, 15 years? Like, what do you think we're going to be doing, conversation designers working with LLMs? Yeah, I, it's a very good question. It's a very hard question to predict because I don't think, like I'd, I'd been, I'd played with GPT-3 like a year ago and I didn't think that we'd be here. Um, so, you know, it's probably worth saying that like, what, what I predict is probably in the next 10 years may actually happen in the next five years. Um, but, I, you know, I think we've touched on conversation designers becoming, you know, stewards of knowledge mm -hmm. uh, um, and, and training the LLM to find that right piece of knowledge will yeah. become a big thing. I think persona design starts to become a big thing. So, you know, your LLM will say, get the information from a knowledge base um, and what you would actually generally find at the moment is it might just kind of word vomit at you with all the information. Yeah. Um, so what we'll probably start to see is like persona LLM. So like an LLM that checks your response and formats it the, the way that your brand wants it to be. It adopts the tone of voice that your, your, uh, uh, brand needs to have and all that sort of thing mm -hmm. um and, and you know prompt chaining will, will definitely become the primary way of, of designing conversation journeys I, I think in within the next five years 
going past that, that's where stuff where I'm, I, I, I kind of don't know whether this will actually start happening for them, but um, I would say LLMs will start to self-improve. Yeah. So um, with kind of human reinforced learning, you know, you'll start to see enterprises be able to have an LLM that just improves because we're giving it that thumbs up when it does the right thing and it, it might start to go, um, um, you know, based on all the thumbs up that you've given me, I know that this is a place where I could improve. Here's my improvement. Do you approve it? Yeah. Um, um, I think, you know, I've talked about how prompt chaining will be like a, 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 a big thing. I also think that in the next 10 years, like prompt engineering will actually just become an everyday skill. Mm -hmm. um, I think it'll be like, I don't know if you remember this, but I used to see on job ads, like a proficiency in Microsoft Office Suite or Outlook or something like that. Like it'll be like a proficiency in, you know, prompting open AI or Claude or whatever. Like I, I think that that's just going to become a, a skill. I don't think mm -hmm. it'll be limited to conversational AI. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and what else? Sometimes, like, I, yeah, like, I, I don't think canvas based conversation design may be as, as ubiquitous as it is now. I think we'll still probably design a conversation as a way of feeding it to an LLM as a way of expressing what we want it to do mm -hmm. but as a kind of design it and build this kind of thing I, I don't know whether it'll be a, as common um, yeah so, so like I can definitely see a a pullback of, of you know um our need to go in and design every single little variant and all that sort of thing. Like, I, I just don't think that that will, will happen. Mm -hmm. And um, 10 years. I wouldn't be surprised if we have an event that really scares everyone. Like, <laughs> some, something I think will happen, which kind of, you know, pushes regulation to happen, like, a lot more and a lot faster, and we'll have those kind of, a similar kind of, you know, Cambridge Analytica moment or, or, or worse, like that, yeah. that happened with social media, we'll, we'll have something like that within the next 10 years, which makes us go, how did we not see this? Like, blah, 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 like, and, and all the, you know, AI ethicists at the moment who are kind of going, you know, we've got to slow down. Like, this, <laughs> this is getting, this is going too fast for us to, to, to be able to, um, to be able to, you know, reliably do the right thing like I, I definitely think that at the current rate that we're going there, there will be some sort of bad event that, that yeah. we all go to Lily, you know, like, no sure uh, I mean I'm surprised that's not happened already because I've heard of people using chat GPT to find vulnerabilities in bank uh like bank backend you know APIs and all sorts of things and it's like that's so creative <laughs> In such a devious way, I'm, I'm yeah, surprised, yeah. you know, there hasn't been more uh, so far, like more shocking news of what people have managed to do with yeah, it. Yeah. And I think if you're, if you're interested in that sort of um, stuff, there is a really good AI um, ethicist. Her name is um, Ajaya Kotra. So okay. she, she has a blog called Planned Obsolescence. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think... You know, she she talks about um, uh, she talks about like the the problems and the risks of AI in a way that is feels realistic. Mm -hmm. Like her her kind of doomsday scenario that she, she um, outlines, which I won't go through, but it it feels much more realistic than like you know you tell an LLM to make paper clips and then it ends up taking all the 
metal in the world and then killing all the people because people have metal and blood. Like that just doesn't seem realistic, but yeah, yeah. her kind of fears and, and how we get to those it seem a lot more um, realistic. And, and, yeah, like realistically that that's probably going to happen. I don't necessarily think it's it's a concern as much for enterprises doing a customer service bot mm -hmm. but you know when, when things when 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 they start self-improving i think that's this that's that that's the point where stuff starts to maybe get a bit um yeah risky yeah that's it i think you know we're not just needing to ground the llms to keep them from going off rails but we also need to ground ourselves and you know like see uh see what under, try to understand what's going on as well as we can with with this new technology and always keep checking when it's going too far in one direction and seeing you know like yeah do we need to rein it in now you know like is this going too much in the wrong direction yeah, yeah i mean i mean i think you know i think the hardest thing with understanding an llm is like an llm is based on the human brain <laughs> yeah so like we don't really understand how the brain works so, mm. so yeah <laughs> the, the, we're, we're trying to understand how an llm works and it's i think we can definitely do it there probably just needs to be a whole heap more money pumped into that kind of side of ai like the, this interpretability yeah um, it's something i talked about briefly in that blog post like i think interpretability is is the key for for safe ai um experiments being able to understand this is why it did the thing it did when i asked it to do it mm. um and that helps businesses and enterprises and all that sort of stuff a lot because all of a sudden you you once you add a layer of predictability like if i do this then it will do this or, or we'll do something along the lines of this then that makes you know the the it makes the tool far more powerful yeah yeah and that you know, it could be a very useful tool for everybody to to see how a system you know uh, explains the choices it made. And I think um, you know, many people, as as you were just saying, like we don't really understand how the human brain works, and many people can't say how they reached a certain conclusion. You know, because you need to be very aware of all the details, but then also be able to. Uh, form a narrative with a you know like start middle and end that describes that without uh leaving too much out you know yeah um yeah it's fascinating stuff okay peter i've kept you long enough thanks so much man <laughs> it's been amazing no it's been amazing it's lovely to to get to spend some time with you um i think the only time i've met you was at like 2 a.m in a mcdonald's <laughs> in arlington when yeah it was I, I was definitely after a bit too many beers so it's nice to uh, yeah. to have a that was sober... a funny night. <laughs> that was a very karaoke. Fun. <laughs> yeah, it was a very funny night. Um, yeah, it was a good one. I just wish I remembered more of it. Yeah, <laughs> I think that was the voice flow party as well. So yeah, it's come full yeah. circle. No, exactly, exactly, totally, totally. Yeah, that is the thread, the running, yeah, yeah the running theme. So yeah, thanks so much. Great to talk to you, and I'm um, I'm really super keen to see uh, what what articles and what things you're going to be doing to, you know, to show us all um, how, how to do conversation design, how to incorporate LLMs and how to do it all in voice flow. Thank you. Thank you. It's been rad. Cool. Cheers, ben. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.